Hello and welcome back to the channel. I do want to say today's video is brought to you by Wodoku, but more on them in just a moment. Over the years I've covered a lot of different true crime cases. I know a lot of you know me for my 911 calls, but I have covered a bunch of other true crime cases that don't have any 911 calls. Occasionally I'll throw a compilation 911 video together, but I don't think I've done that with any of my other videos. So I figured this would be a great opportunity. There was a lot that fell between the lines and they make you think a lot. From a sheriff caught red-handed getting away with his crimes to a prosecutor who turned into a double murderer. All the different stories you're about to hear are going to make you think very deeply. And I do want to say viewer discretion is advised. Not all of the stories are really that graphic, but I guess they could be upsetting to some people. And speaking of things that make you think, it's a great time to talk about today's video sponsor, Wodoku. Wodoku is a wood block puzzle game that meets Sudoku, and it's completely free to play at the Google Store or in the Apple Store. Make sure to click the link in the description or scan the QR code to start playing for free now. So really quick before we start, I want to say my favorite thing about this game. Most games say free to play, but then there's people that can put in a whole bunch of money and just crush everyone. Well, this game is 100% free to play. And you're not against other people. You're playing the one person who's the best to play against. Yourself. As you advance in the game, the levels will get harder. But the good thing is, is you have no time limit. And if you lose a life, don't worry. You don't gotta pay money to keep playing. Just play again. I do have to say, the game is a lot harder than it looks. And when you start advancing and they have gems that are in the puzzle shapes, that makes it really interesting. So what you do is you just arrange the wooden blocks to form a line, or a square. And from there, you just need to complete the goals up above. Sometimes it's just to get a certain amount of points, other times you just collect the gemstones that are required. It's a very simple concept, but it gets very difficult when they start having spots that are filled and you gotta work around it. But it's extremely fun too. So if you wanna help the channel out and get yourself some brain activity going, make sure to click the link in the description or scan that QR code on the screen and start playing for free today. I wanna give a big shout out to Wodoku for sponsoring this video. And without any further ado, let's begin. Dana McKay grew up in Georgia. Her first marriage fell apart after her husband cheated on her. She later moved to Virginia, where she found work at a carpet and flooring company. That's when she met John McKay, a United States Army Staff Sergeant. And I'm just going to add something in here right here. When I first read this, I had to make sure it wasn't a buddy of mine because his name from the military, John McKay. I was like, oh my good, better not be this dude. It's not, it's a different guy. Back to the story. When Dana first met John, she was afraid to open up to him. She feared putting her trust in someone new. She didn't want to go through what she had went through in her first marriage again. In July of 2012, Dana's health started to deteriorate. She was frequently experiencing dizziness and headaches. A few months later, she went to get checked out and found out she had hydrocephalus. That means there was a buildup of fluids in her brain, and these fluids were putting pressure on her brain, risking severe damage or even death. Dana ended up getting brain surgery, and since she could no longer work, she went on leave while John took up another job at an automotive parts store to pay off medical bills. On top of all that, he had to help take care of Dana. While working his second job, John met 34-year-old Nicole Hoochin, who was married to Nace Hoochin, a former soldier. And their marriage, similar to John and Dana's, was breaking apart. John and Nicole started an affair soon after they met. In the beginning, they were just making out at work. Then they started going to hotels during their lunch breaks. John even brought Nicole to his home that he shared with Dana when Dana was away at her grandmother's funeral. Dana found out about John's affair when she returned and noticed there were items in the house that weren't hers. As heartbroken as she was, she did not want another failed marriage, so she gave John an ultimatum. Either he leaves Nicole, or Dana would inform his commanding officer about his infidelity. John decided he would give his marriage another try. He broke up with Nicole and started to tend to his relationship with Dana. Nicole was not just upset about the breakup. She was enraged. Dana had come between her and John, and she wasn't going to stand for it. She started to send threatening messages to Dana, and even drove past her home a few times a day. Dana was scared for her life. She even opened up to all her friends about the threats and harassment. John traveled to New York to see family, leaving Dana at home alone. 
The next day, Dana's mother tried to reach her, but she couldn't get through to her daughter. Afraid that something might have happened, she called one of Dana's neighbors and asked them to go check in on Dana. The neighbor walked into the house to find it ransacked. When the police got involved, they found Dana in her bedroom. She was lying naked on the floor. She was bruised and had many bleeding wounds on her face and head. There were blood smears on the walls, too. It was clear that someone had beat her to death. The police then discovered a blue latex glove on Dana's back and strands of blonde hair in her palm. They sent this evidence off for testing. After getting in touch with Dana's mom and John, the police started to look into who could have been behind the attack. They started with interviews, and that's when Dana's friends told the authorities about Nicole's threats and how Nicole would also stalk Dana. However, Nicole had an alibi. She claimed that she was out of town with a coworker, and when authorities brought up the blonde hair that was clamped in Dana's hand, Nicole said it couldn't be hers. She even took her own hair down to the station for testing. The lab results for the glove and blonde hair didn't point the police towards a suspect. There were no fingerprints on the glove, and the hair turned out to be Dana's. So the question still remained. Who killed Dana? On July 29th, two days after Dana's murder, John finally met with the police. The authorities were immediately suspicious of him because he seemed insensitive to his wife's brutal murder. But John's alibi that he was out of town kept him in the clear. That was until a fellow soldier handed John's mobile phone to the police. John had given it to the soldier for safekeeping, but given Dana's slaying and certain messages and emails on the phone that implicated John and Nicole, the soldier felt that coming forward was the right thing. That's when the police discovered John and Nicole had been discussing Dana's murder via emails and messages. In one email, John asked Nicole, Will Dana be gone before I get back? I'll be forever in debt to you and will show you every day. Nicole replied, Trying to make it happen ASAP. Both John and Nicole initially said they were just fantasizing about Dana's death, that they didn't actually intend on carrying through with their plans. But the authorities arrested them anyway and charged them with conspiracy to commit murder and first-degree murder. Apart from the emails, phone records later proved that John and Nicole were behind the murder. On one call, Nicole basically admitted that the murder was done and that there was a lot of screaming. But the case had not unraveled yet, as there were two more accomplices involved. Although John and Nicole were involved in Dana's murder, there was still the question of who the actual killer was. The authorities soon found their suspect, and it was a shock to all when it was revealed that it was none other than Nace, Nicole's husband. Nace was open about his involvement to the police. He admitted that when Nicole asked him if he could get rid of Dana, he agreed to kill Dana in exchange for $20,000. The plot also included one more individual, Gregory Crawford, one of John's colleagues at the automotive parts store. It turns out Nicole wasn't even out of town the night Nace killed Dana. She was downstairs with Gregory. They wrecked the house so it looked like there had been a robbery. All this while Nace was beating Dana to death upstairs. Other more disturbing details came to light after that. For one, Nace had used a breaker bar to beat Dana to death. That explained a lot of the stab wounds on Dana. The injuries on her hands suggest she tried to fight Nace off and protect herself. The next day, Gregory burned everyone's clothes and threw the breaker bar into a nearby river. He disposed of all the evidence of what they had done. Not long after, John McKay was interviewed while he was in jail. Sir, I, I, I guess the best place to start would be, obviously the police are charging you with conspiracy, with being a part of this, and with first degree murder. What do you say to those charges? Huh? Sorry, take your time. My wife is dead. It's not, not enough. What do you mean when you say it's not enough? I'm still fucking alive. The, according to a police report, there, there were emails exchanged between you and the other woman. How do you pronounce her name? Her last name? Halchin? Yes, Halchin. Um, that you had sent her an email 
asking if the deed had been done yet, and if it had, that you would be forever grateful to her and, sh and show her that every day. Did you, in fact, send that email? I'm sure I did. I'm sorry, I didn't hear what I'm you sure said. I'm sure I did. You did? You sure you did? The, I don't know if, you, if the police had shared with you the circumstances, but it sounded like a pretty violent killing. Um, your wife had multiple stab wounds on your face. The bedroom door had been kicked in. Was it supposed to go like that? It was supposed to be just a fantasy thing. That's all we ever did on uh, emails and stuff. Fantasy. Everything that we ever did was fantasy. Fun. It's craziness. Never, it never should have went this far. It wasn't until I couldn't get my wife on the phone when I, I realized that something was wrong. That it might actually be real. And then when I couldn't get in touch with her and I couldn't get in touch with her mom and her stepdad, uh, it started sinking in. And I was up in New York at the time and I was driving back when I finally was able to talk to the detective and he said that my wife had been really killed. So that email that you sent out saying, has the deed been done? If so, I'll be forever grateful. You never got a response to that particular email then? Or did, did she ever tell you, yes, it's done? I don't remember. D e emails, I mean, you can send a text or an email in seconds and forget about it. So it, I couldn't tell you 90% uh, of anything I've ever sent to anybody. So I don't know. And the rear garage door is where um, she was supposed to gain entry to the house. Did you leave that door open for her? Did you tell her about that door? I told her the door was open on occasion, yes. But other people have had keys to my house. When I moved into that house, seven or ten days after we had moved in, uh, a kid walked into the front door that was locked with a key to the house. He was with a cleaning company. Um, one of the things that we were going to do was change the locks on the doors. The only door that ever got done was the, the back living room door. So, yeah, I, I, probably, I did tell her that the door would be unlocked, but my wife checked the doors, every all the doors in the house every day. Staff Sergeant, the question I have to ask you though, sir, is if this was just supposed to be a fantasy, why would you relate a detail such as where a door would be unlocked, where entry could be gained, to Ms. Couchin if this was only supposed to be a fantasy? I don't know. Just, I don't know. I have no clue. And in the fantasy, was, was the killing supposed to be carried out the way it was with that, that level of violence? No, nothing like that. No. No. How did the scenario play out in your fantasy? In my fantasy, she fell down the stairs. Maybe something like that. Not nothing like. Or you mean push down the stairs? Well, she. My wife had balance issues because of the surgery she had a year prior, um, and every once in a while she would almost fall down. And then the dogs, our dogs, would always be under her feet. So it's not crazy to think that the dog would trip her because my dogs have actually tripped her a couple of times in the past. So that would be a crazy fantasy that, hey, she fell down the stairs because the dog tripped her. But, but that's not a fantasy about killing someone. You said you guys had fantasized about killing her. Boy. Yeah. Um, like, hey, let's kill her and then we can go and run away and be together forever. But, I mean, that never works. I still have, a, I had a job as of yesterday. Um, she had a job. Um, responsibilities. You're just not going to somehow find a million dollars on a corner and run away for the rest of your life. So it was just bullshit talk. I mean, if you wanted to run away right now, could you? <laughs> I can't. I couldn't two days ago. I had $152 in my bank account yet two days ago and I made it from upper New York to the house with that much, with all that, that's it. So there's not like there was any realism to it, no truth to it, because I wasn't going nowhere. It, it sounds to me, though, almost like the only thing you're lamenting right now, though, is your situation. I mean, what about the fact that your wife was killed? 
if I spend the rest of my life in jail because of what happened to her, it won't be long enough. So what you're saying is you're ready to accept the punishment that comes your way. No matter what, my wife is dead. And because of what I said, somebody killed her, I think. So, 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 Staff Sergeant, you, you're telling me that you never, you never said to her, go over here on, go there on this night, do it tonight, do it then. It was never planned to that detail. No. No. I mean, I'm, I've been in the military a long time, so whenever I look at a situation, I look at it from every aspect, all points of view, and no matter what I'm doing, I always figure out every option, every aspect of it. And that's just one of those things. When you're talking to somebody, you just naturally talk about every aspect of everything. You know. But didn't it occur to you, I mean, if, if you were dating this other woman, you guys were having an affair, okay, and you've admitted to that, correct? That you were having an affair with this counselor. Okay. Didn't you have some indication of what her personality might be like? I mean, no, she was a great person. Every time I ever saw her, she was a great person. She had anxiety issue, yes. She had, um, um, she was, yeah, she was taking medicine for anxiety, but not for crazy want to kill somebody. And it, and it wasn't just a killing, and I don't want to harp on this again, Staff Sergeant, but I have to bring it up, and that is that it was a very violent killing. Do you know that one of your wife's fingers had actually been severed off? No. You had not been told that? Police investigators didn't tell you that? They showed me a, a quick picture of something, and that was it. When you saw the picture, Surely that must have relayed some of the level of violence to you. What did you think when you saw that picture? That if I ever got my hands on the person who actually did it, with three seconds I would kill him. Knowing now who did it, at least according to who the police say did it, do you still feel that way? If I have the option and the opportunity, she's dead. That's all there is to it. So in, in no circumstance would that relationship ever continue, even if for some reason the two of you were let out? If it's found that she is guilty, if I have a chance, I will kill her. No questions asked. It's, it sounds a little strange you saying that right now when you had fantasized about this very thing with her. Fantasy and reality are two different things, are they not? So when you're playing in this game, everything is cool because you can just go, oh, I didn't mean that I hit the reset button or whatever. I'll see you tomorrow. So at the end of the day, well, you can just put that over in the corner and don't worry about it no more or don't think about it. But now that it's reality, everything has changed. It doesn't matter anymore. And if I die, I die. But if I can take her out too, I'm gonna. If she's, if she's guilty, if I could take her out, I'd kill it right now. And then you'd be facing another murder charge. My wife is dead. I really don't care. To hear you talk about your wife like that now, to make a statement like that now, why would you have been having an affair with another woman in the first place? My wife got very sick a year ago. Um, she had hydrocephalus, very debilitating. She couldn't move, couldn't talk very well, didn't remember anything. Um, shortly before she was diagnosed with it and it started getting really bad, I had taken a second job. Just for fun, for extra money, play money. And she got real sick and then I took that job and I, I needed that job just to make ends meet. Um, gone 20 hours a day. I see my wife two hours a week. Um, things just happened, and she was she worked wound up working at the same store, and they put us on the same schedules, and we became friends, and then it got more. 
Um, and then I got into this relationship with her, and it, it just got too deep, I guess. It got the the fantasy part was a lot of fun, you know. Um, Did you have any communication with Miss Couchin in any shape or form after? the murder happened, whether you knew about it at that point or not, did did you guys exchange any kind of communication after the fact? Um, a little bit, yes. Yes. Um, that weekend, she had told me that she had to go to Fredericksburg to pick up her sister's twins because her sister wanted to give them kids up. So. Her and her mother went up, were going up there, or went up there to pick up her niece and nephew. And then she told me about how the clutch went out in the car, and they limped home, and then they had to go up the next day in her vehicle to go get the kids. So yes, I had conversations with her, and it was about kids, about her kids, her niece and nephew. The subject of your wife didn't come up at all? And you know... The police are, the case they're building on this is that you did this so that you could have the relationship with Ms. Gouchin and so that you wouldn't have to worry about a divorce and alimony and losing property and whatnot. What do you say to that? It had come up, yeah. The talk like that had come up, yes. When, when you had the, the fantasy discussions, you mean? Yeah. Um... Yeah. What was said? I told her that I was not leaving my wife. I said, if Dana would agree to an equitable divorce, we would get divorced and, and that would be fine. Um, but she wants to stay. She wants to um, work through this, the affair. She wanted to work through it. Um, go to counseling like we started, make our marriage better. And then um, come March, move from here to go somewhere else because that's when I was supposed to move. That, hmm? You said that to Ms. Couchin that if your wife was willing to work through this you were going to stay married? I told her I'm not divorcing my wife if she wants to stay and ruin my career and all that I'm not going to divorce her. If it's an amicable divorce we will get divorced and then her and I would try, try life together. What was Ms. Couchin's reaction to that? She said she understood, always. And at no point did she ever relate to you that she had actually gone over there and killed your wife? She never said that she went and killed my wife, no. She never did. Not one time did she say, I killed your wife. Did she say she was planning to? Um, she said she had thought about how she would do it, yes. Yes. And what did she say? What, what, what were those plans? What did she think? Fall down the stairs, make it look like an accident. Something like that. Nothing like, like what happened. No. Because she's a small person. I, I don't even know how I could even think about her being able to do stuff like that. I don't know. You're talking about your girlfriend? Yes. Um, are you just... I'm wondering, if you'll allow me, I'm wondering, Staff Sergeant, if, if you feel the way you feel because of the way the, the crime was carried out, because of the violence involved. If Ms. Gatson had just pushed your wife down the stairs, would you maybe feel different about this? No. My wife is still dead. I, I never wanted her to, to die. I just wanted her to divorce me amicably. That was it. There was never any, um, well, she's dead, it's good, let's go. Uh, I mean, there might have been talk about it, yeah, but it was not act upon it, never. Never act upon it. I mean, it's like people playing World of Warcraft games. They get into that character for 12, 14 hours a day, but once they get out of the character, it's, it's what they just did before. It's not real. And that talk was never real. Not for me. It was fun. It was, it, was, it was just, man, if we lived in a crazy world, the crazy shit we could do, that was it. Now that it's all really happened, what would you say to the family 
of your wife and your family. If I get out of jail any time before I'm dead, it's too soon. During the ensuing trial, Nace pleaded guilty to the murder charge. In turn, the prosecution dropped the capital murder and conspiracy to commit murder charges. John and Nicole pleaded guilty to first-degree murder, whereas Gregory pleaded guilty to conspiracy to commit capital murder. Nicole also addressed Dana's family during the trial, saying that she was very sorry for the part she played in the murder, and that she wished Dana had never met her or John. In the end, Nicole got 23 years in prison, Nace got 40 years, John got 28, and Gregory got 17 years. They all would have had harsher punishments had it not been for their plea agreements, which helped them avoid the death penalty. Paul Murdoch took his six friends out on his father's boat on February 24, 2019. They went to a house party together and drank on the way there. At midnight, when they were ready to leave, Paul suggested they visit a bar to drink some more. It was common for Paul to drink and get behind the wheel of a car, or in this case, a boat. Being the son of a well-known lawyer meant Paul thought he could get away with such things, and he often did. As if driving drunk wasn't bad enough, he was also under the legal drinking age while he did such things. On the night of February 24, 2019, he used his brother's driver's license and his family credit card to buy alcohol. Paul entered the bar with his friend Connor, as they were the only two with fake IDs. After taking shots, they rejoined their friends close to where their boat was docked. It was now past 1 a.m., and Paul was acting rowdy. And when they all boarded the boat, Paul's friends could tell it wasn't safe for him to be behind the wheel. He was going around in circles and speeding. When his friends protested, he would let go of the wheel to argue back. When one of his friends, Anthony, asked to be let off, Paul refused. Paul was speeding down narrow passageways, where he eventually crashed the boat in Archer's Creek Bridge. That's when Anthony's girlfriend, Mallory Beach, who wasn't wearing a life jacket, fell into the water and was unable to be located. That's when Connor dialed 911. 911, where's your emergency? Hello? Please fire any of Hello? We're in a boat crash on Archer Street. Where, whereabouts on Archer Street? In Archer Street, the only bridge on Archer Street. Archer Street? Archer's Creek. You Archer's Creek. Uh, Archer's Creek. Is it Fallon? Okay. What's going on? It's Bob Paris Island. Right. What? What's going on? We we're, we're in a boat crash. You know what? What kind of a? A boat crash. A a boat? Did you say a boat crash? A boat crash. Okay. So you're at uh, are you at the dock? Hello. Are you are you at the dock? No, we just crashed in a boat. Okay, are you in the water or are you? We're we're in the boat. Okay. We have someone missing. Okay, okay. Hang on one second, okay? All right, Bob. No. Archer's Creek. Archer's Creek, correct? Paul, what is this? Paul, what is this bridge called? Okay, Paul. where? How far? <laughs> Please send someone. Oh, no, I'm coming. We're coming. We're coming. Okay. See. Well, how far off shore are you? In the in Archer's Creek. Right. How far out? The only there's only one bridge in Archer's Creek. Uh, you by the bridge? There's the only one bridge in Archer's Creek. Is this a mixed disabled boat? Okay. And well, who's that in the background? There's there's six of us and one is missing. Okay. There's six, but one is missing. 
So six, do you guys have life jackets on? Yes, ma'am. We have we have more than enough life jackets, but we're on the bank. So you're missing. Who's missing? Uh, a female, Mallory B. Is missing. Okay. Where? Okay. What's your name, sir? My name my name is Connor Cook. When the police arrived, they had to calm Anthony down. He was beyond stressed out about Mallory. The deputy managed to get him to relax in a patrol car. And then Anthony saw Paul smiling at him in a provocative way. The police had to keep Anthony from getting his hands on Paul. When asked who was behind the wheel of the boat, Anthony said Paul was. The authorities took everyone except Anthony to the hospital. Anthony wanted to stay behind, most likely hopeful that Mallory would show up. Meanwhile, at the hospital, Paul was stubborn and refused to talk to the doctors. When the hospital staff tested his blood, he was three times over the legal limit. Paul's father, Alec Murdoch, was also at the hospital, speaking to all the survivors of the crash. He was telling them not to reveal to law enforcement that his son was behind the accident. His plan was to pin it on Connor, who he also told to keep his mouth shut, and whose family would later sue Alec for this. The authorities searched for Mallory for eight days. On March 3rd, volunteers came across her body five miles down the river from where Paul crashed the boat. Over a month later, Paul was charged for boating under the influence, as well as causing Mallory's death. He pleaded not guilty. And eventually the charges were dropped. And the reason they were dropped is actually covered in a previous video of mine. Two years after this incident, Alec Murdoch, the father, also an attorney, murdered both Paul and his wife. He had a very lengthy criminal record, from stealing company funds to insurance fraud and all kinds of different things. He had been getting away with his crimes for years. But finally after the murder of Paul and his wife, he was charged with over 90 different crimes. And then not long after that, he tried to kill himself for a $10 million insurance claim for his last living son and was caught there too and charged with insurance fraud. Alex Murdoch is a well-known lawyer in South Carolina. Following in the footsteps of his father and grandfather, he works as a part-time prosecutor and has many convictions under his belt, many of them resulting in the death penalty. Hence, his family name carries a lot of influence. One of his sons, Paul, was on trial for crashing a boat and killing Mallory Beach, a 19-year-old. According to police reports, he was drunk and acting hostile when the accident happened. This tragedy occurred in 2019. Four years before that, in 2015, another 19-year-old, Stephen Smith, was discovered about 15 miles away from Alex's hunting lodge. The death was ruled a hit and run although there was no proof that a hit-and-run occurred. Investigators even discovered clear signs of foul play. On top of that, certain leads suggested Stephen was in a relationship with Alex's oldest son, Richard. In 2018, Alex's housekeeper, Gloria Satterfield, also passed away from a trip and fall. Alex settled in the case that followed from that tragedy. Unfortunately for Alex, the mysterious deaths surrounding his family would not end there. In June 2021, he returned home one day to find his wife Maggie and his son Paul shot execution style in dog kennels. He immediately picked up the phone and dialed 911. <laughs> My wife and child got badly. Okay, you said 4147 Moselle Road in Allison? Sir? You said 4147 Moselle Road in Allison? Yes, sir. 4147 okay. Moselle Road. Stay on the line with me, okay? Yes, sir. Stay on the line with me, okay? 
Okay. Khan Accounting Communications. Carlton, I have an Alex Murdoch on the line, caller from 4147 Moselle Road. He's advising that his wife and child was shot. Okay, and sir, give me the address again. It's 4147 Moselle Road. I've been up to it now. It's bad. Okay. Oh. Okay, and are they breathing? No, ma'am. Okay, and you said it's your wife and your son? My wife and my son. Are they in a vehicle? No, ma'am. They're on the ground out at my kennel. <laughs> okay, and did you see anyone? Okay, is he breathing at all? No, no. Is she? Okay, do you see anything? Do you see anyone in the area? No, ma'am. No, ma'am. What color is your house on the outside? What color is your house on the outside? Uh, it's white. You can't see it from the road. Okay. Is it a house or a mobile home? It's a house. Okay. And what is your name? My name is Alex Murdoch. Okay. Did you hear anything, or did you come home and find them? No, man. I've been gone. I, I just came back. Okay. And was anyone else supposed to be at your house? No, ma'am. Please hurry. We're getting somebody out there to you. Okay. What is her name? Maggie. Maggie and Paul. Maggie is her name? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And please hurry. <laughs> uh, we're getting somebody out there to you. Me asking you these questions don't slow them down, okay? And you sure they're not breathing? Is he moving at all, your son? I know you said that she was shot, but what about your son? <laughs> Nobody. They're not. Neither one of them's moving. <laughs> what is your telephone number? <laughs> and does anything look out of place? Ma'am, I, I not not particularly, really. No, ma'am. Okay. Are they close, ma'am? Yeah, they're, they've been around with you ever since uh, you have got on the phone with me. I have multiple people coming out there to you. Okay. I don't want you to touch them at all, okay? I don't, I don't know if you've already touched them, but I don't, I don't want you to touch them just in case they can get any kind of evidence, okay? Uh, I, I already touched them trying to get a, um, to see if they were breathing. Okay. Well, I, I just don't want you to move anything just in case they can get any kind of evidence, okay? Ma'am, I'm going to call. I, I need to call some of my family. Okay. Well, well, do me a favor for me. Whenever you see the officer or the medics, because they're, they're all coming to you. Absolutely. Okay. But we have them come in. Turn on the flashes on your vehicle so they can see you, okay? You got the flashers on for me? I do. Okay. All right. Just whenever you see them. Okay. How old is your son? 22. Okay. All right. We're, we're getting them out there to you, okay? And I will answer if you call. All right. In the time that's passed since Alex's wife and son were found murdered, the authorities are no closer to figuring out what happened. At first, Alex himself was interviewed by investigators, but since he had an alibi, he is no longer a person of interest. Authorities collected evidence relating to the murders at a swamp miles away, and Maggie's phone was also found on a road close to the family's home where she was killed. But the reason for the murders and the culprits remain a mystery. Meanwhile, sources online claim that the killings have something to do with the deaths of either Mallory, Stephen, or Gloria. 
And since the writing of this script, there has been more updates I'm going to fill you in on right now. So now that you've listened to both of those 911 calls and the little backstory behind it, let's give some updates. I will say that in court, Alec kept calling his son Papa or Paul Paul. I couldn't really tell the way he said it. He was always blabbering like a freaking idiot. But he didn't mention him like that when he was doing interviews and whatnot. It was only in court. So it sounds to me like he was trying to garner sympathy with that. And not only that, the original story that he told police before he went to court is completely different from what he told when he was in court. Did you have that tan blackout and a 12-gauge shotgun on that golf cart when you drove down there? No. You didn't? No. Did you see them when you were down there? No. No. So we got you back around 849 and you're leaving at 902, correct? And you didn't see any weapons down there. You just happened to be back there. You didn't hear anything at all. Did you hear anything at all, Mr. Murdoch, during that time period? No, I did not. You didn't? Didn't you tell law enforcement that you thought you heard them pull up? Didn't you tell law enforcement that? I did think they had pulled up. All right, so that was that you did think that? Yes. All right, so now you're saying there was a car pulling up? No. You didn't testify to that yesterday, did you, in your new version of events that no, I, you I don't construct? Mr. Waters, I don't believe there was a car pulling up. Okay, but that's what you told law enforcement, didn't you? No, I told law enforcement that I thought they had pulled up. Okay. All right, but you're saying you couldn't hear blackout shots, supposedly, but you could hear that, correct? I, I didn't say I couldn't hear blackout shots, but I'm saying that I thought when, when I got up from taking a nap, if I took a nap, but when I got up from laying down, as I was getting ready to go to my mom's, there was a point in time where I thought Maggie and Paul had come back. You also told them that you thought you heard a wildcat, but maybe it was a person or something like that as well? No, that's not what I said. What did you say then? I said when I went outside that there's a, a, a house cat that's, a, that's gone wild, and he hangs around. He goes from hanging around the shop, goes from hanging around the house, different times. You might, and, and there'll be times you don't see him. And he had been around the house. Mm-hmm. And when I went outside, I believe that cat was over there. Okay. But, and you made a point of mentioning I that never, to law enforcement. I never thought it was a person. All right. But you made a point of mentioning that to law enforcement, correct? In the course of discussing it, I did tell them that. But you never told them all this new story that you've constructed in light of this trial, is that correct? I did not tell them that I went to the kennel. I lied about that. And at the same time, you also looked at this jury and tried to tell them that you had been cooperative in this investigation. Uh, Other than lying to them about going to the kennel, I was cooperative in every aspect of this investigation. He claims that his business partners told him not to talk without a lawyer. So that's why he decided to lie, rather than not speak at all. And this guy was a prosecutor for a while too, so this makes it even more baffling. Oh, and he was also addicted to pills, which might explain why he was licking his lips like a crackhead the entire time. He even admits to having pills in his pocket at the time when he found his wife and son murdered. When asked why he lied to authorities, he also said, Did you continue lying after that night? Did you not? Well, once I lied, I continued to lie, yes, sir. Why? You know, oh, what a tangled web we weave. But once I told a lie, I mean, I told my family, I. Throughout the hours of court testimony, he admitted to stealing millions from his clients as well. Even on the years where his income, he was making a couple million. One of the big things he said in his initial interviews was he was not down at the kennels. But during court, that was proven to be a lie when they found a TikTok. Get back. Get back. Quick, Cash. Hey, Bubba. It's a guinea. 
There's a chicken. Come here, Come here, Cash. Come here, Cash. Quick. He had gone down there and was taking a chicken out of one of his dog's mouths. That's the only way they found out he was down there. Well, minus a couple cell phone records as well, which I'll show here soon. But Alec admits that the story is new. He also admits to the lie about not being at the kennel. So then he changed his whole story to match the timeline that he had before court. And, and so you disagree this is a new story? You disagree with that characterization? Yes. This, this is the first time that this is being told openly. And you disagree to my characterization that you've got a photographic memory about the details that have to fit now that you know the, these facts, but you're fuzzy on the other stuff that complicates that. You disagree with that? I do disagree with that. I, I, I think that I, I, think th right. th that I have a good this. memory about a lot of things on this. When he left the kennel, he was going to go see his mother in another city. He claims that he told Paul and Maggie that he'd be back, but says that he doesn't remember his exact last conversation with Maggie, which is a bit odd because usually when someone you love dies, you do remember the last conversation you had. And what did you do after that? Got back on the golf cart. Mm -hmm. And what did you do after that? I left. You left? Now, Just did I jumped leave? on the golf cart and left. Well, that's what I was getting ready to say. Did I get on the golf cart and leave that second? Probably not. But did I get on the golf cart and leave very quickly after that? I did. Okay, yeah, I think you testified yesterday. I got out of there. I did. Why'd you get out of there so quick, Mr. Murdoch? Because it was chaotic, it was hot, and I was getting ready to do exactly what I didn't want to do. You were getting ready to do what you didn't want to do? That's correct. Yeah. I was getting ready to sweat. I was getting ready to work. I went back to the air conditioner. So did you say goodbye, according to your new story? Did I say goodbye? Yeah. Did you talk to them at all, or did you just get the chicken, put it on there, jump on there, and oh, just no. take off? I wouldn't have just gone off. I mean, I would have said, I'm leaving. Okay. Did I say goodbye or bye? And again, go but, ahead. I mean, there would have been some... You know, there, there would have been some exchange. I'm not staying here. Well, what was that exchange? I mean, you have, you've had such a photographic memory about these new stories. What, 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 what happened here? No, that's not, I can't tell you the exact words. You don't remember your conversation after you put that chicken up. Did y'all talk about the chicken? No, I don't think we did. Did you talk with Paul about Cash's tail? After the chicken? Yeah. No, I, I know I didn't do that. Did you tell Maggie I'm going to go check on him? At that point, no, I don't. I don't did think you tell I did. Maggie, oh, it's hot out here. If they gonna go back, I, I certainly would have said something to that effect. All right. So, unlike everything else with the new story, you just can't recall what what that would have been. Well, uh, you know, I mean. You're making that categorization. I, I think there's other things about that that I can't remember. But if the question is, can I remember exactly what words I used when I gave Maggie some uh, salutation when I'm leaving, I can't tell you what those were. All right. Just like you don't remember, according to your new story, the last conversation you had with Maggie. No, I remember, I remember having the con my last conversation with Maggie. Alex also claimed that Paul wasn't there. But according to the records you're about to see, Paul was on the property according to his cell phone. Paul's cell phone shows him at the house, contradicting the claims that Alex made that he was at the shop. And you would agree with me that about 8.38, Paul's phone shows him back up at the kennels. Well, uh, yes, sir, I agree that at 8.38, let me see which one. It's hard for me to figure out which one of these rings, but at 8.38, it shows Paul in whichever one of those rings is 56 meters wide. And I have no reason to believe he wasn't at the kennel. Right. And then 8.44.55, we've already gone through this, but that's the kennel video, right? Yes, sir, that's correct. And you would agree with me that... It lasts about 50 seconds, correct? 
Uh, yes, sir, I agree with that. And you would agree with me moving on to page 19 that both Maggie and Paul's phones locked for the final time around 849. That's what the data shows. After that, you agree that Maggie's phone around 853 shows some steps being taken? That's what the data shows, yes, sir. Data doesn't show who's carrying it, but that's what it shows. Is that correct? That is correct. All right. And then you would agree with me that from 902 to 906, your phone finally comes to life and starts showing a lot of steps. I do agree with that. What were you doing? I was getting ready to go to my mom's house. Getting ready to go? I thought you took a shower already. You were just laying down on the couch. What, what all you need to do to get ready to go to your mom's house? Uh, I mean, there wasn't anything to get ready in, in that aspect, wasn't but anything to get ready, I was wasn't. getting ready to go. I was preparing to leave. I know what I wasn't doing, Mr. Waters, and what I wasn't doing is doing anything uh, as I believe you've implied that I was cleaning off or washing off or washing off guns or putting guns in a raincoat, and I can promise you that I wasn't doing any of that. Okay. <clears throat> Would you agree that that's the last steps recorded on your phone before 902 when you become a very busy bee? If that's what these records show, I, I see I took steps. These records show I took steps between 805 and 809. So would you concede then that you're at the house around 809? I would have thought so, yes. Okay. And you said Paul was already back at that point? No. I, I, I said just the opposite. When did he get there? All right. Are you talking about when I left the shop and went to the house when Maggie was there? Yes, before you ate dinner. No, as I said earlier. Paul and I were at the shop. Mm -hmm. Maggie got home. I left Paul at the shop, and I went to the house. Mm -hmm. I think you were saying that I said I met Paul at the house, and that's incorrect. Paul was still down at the shop when you were at the house, correct? When I first went to the house, Paul was still at the shop, I believe. All right, and was Maggie there when you arrived at the house? Yes, I believe she was. All right, and 809 is the last steps that you have on this phone before 902, correct? That's what the data shows. Your steps that you say when you got to the house is 809 and Paul was still down at the shop, but don't these records reflect that Paul is pinging with GPS data at the house at 808? This record appears to show Paul at the house at 808. Alex also claims that when Maggie came home, she left her phone in the SUV and always does that. Because I know everybody leaves their phone in the car all the time. Mm-hmm. And when you got into the house, where did you go? We've already discussed this. I, I, I took a shower. Whether I did things for a moment before I went to the shower, I'm sure I talked to Maggie um, because she'd been gone. And if she came through the kennel, which I believe she did, we only talked briefly. So I would have talked to her, uh, but I would have quickly gone to take a shower. You would agree with me that the data reflects Maggie start logging steps and her phone disconnecting from the Mercedes around 817, correct? I agree at 817, her phone ends connection to her Mercedes. And starts logging steps? I don't see that, but I don't dispute it. Right. Well, you see the purple line talking about it disconnecting from the Mercedes. I and do see, I see, the, I see where you're talking about. So yeah, yeah. I see at 817, her phone starts logging steps. I agree with that. So would you concede that that appears to be when she arrived? Uh, no, I, I don't believe that's when she arrived. I, I, I believe that, I mean, it, it was very normal for Maggie um, when she's driving to jump out of the car, run inside, go to the bathroom, do things, and either send me or Paul or go back or Buster or go back to her car herself and unplug her phone. So. I mean, I agree that's when her phone's unplugged, but I believe that Maggie got to the house a little bit before that. That's the whole reason why Paul and I went to the house. The prosecutor does a decent job of asking a question and then just letting silence fill the air until Alex breaks. Once again, claiming that Paul wasn't in the house. Okay. But you're saying Paul arrived after Maggie, is that what you're saying? At the house. 
I believe so, time. yes, sir. Okay. That's what I recall. And, and Paul arrived at the house after I arrived at the house, I believe. And if Paul got to the house around about that same time, he wasn't inside with Maggie and I when I went to get to the shower. So you say if Paul got, he wasn't inside with Maggie and you? Is that what you said? Mr. Murdoch, is that what you said? Sir? You said if Paul got the house prior to that, he wasn't inside with you and Maggie, is that what you said? I'm saying he was not inside when I went to get in the shower. Okay. But again, looking back at this data point, 808, we see a little blue dot right there in the middle of the house, don't we? Yeah, that's what these records show. Okay. And it also shows that circle that folks testified to what the range of what it could yeah, absolutely. be within. So, I mean, it clearly look could at, be. Look at that circle. Look, look at what's right in the middle of that circle. Almost like somebody drew a circle around the house, don't you agree? Yeah, I do. But also in that circle is where you would park a truck if you pulled up. All right. So, you know, and I'm not saying that he wasn't in the house. Uh, at some point in time there. But when I went to get in the shower, he wasn't in the house. After a little while, Maggie's phone starts tracking steps. And then some more steps. And then Alex's phone kicks to life as he's leaving for his mother's house. But before he left for his mother's house, you can see a lot of steps going around the house. And Alex's response goes as follows. You were making all these phone calls while you were taking all these steps. Would you concede that? Where you don't remember what you were doing. Well, I was making phone calls and that, that show on here. At 9.05, I called my dad. You know, I, I don't know that I was taking steps like you're saying I'm taking steps. I heard the same testimony you heard, Mr. Waters, and, you know, steps can be recorded uh, any number of ways. I, I don't have a specific recollection of walking around. I don't know if I was hitting my phone like the guy showed or doing whatever that makes steps, but... You know, so you were hitting what, your phone like that while you were making all these phone calls? Hang on, no sir. What I'm saying, Mr. Waters, I don't know that. I'm, I'm just giving you an example. You're saying that I'm running around taking these steps, and while I'm doing that, I'm making telephone calls. What I will agree with is that this data shows that there was 283 steps recorded on my phone. Mm -hmm. And sometime during that period, I made certain phone calls. Okay. All right, so not only for whatever it is, it's recording steps, but you're also making a ton of phone calls, including missed calls to Maggie, who is 1,100 feet away, supposedly. You're using the term a ton of phone calls. Yeah. What I agree is that I, I made the phone calls that are listed on these call data records, mm -hmm. which, you know, are very normal phone calls for me. Alex also made a couple of missed calls to Maggie, and then might have deleted the phone calls not intentionally. Mm -hmm. Do you know why so many phone calls were missing from the log around this relevant time period when law enforcement downloaded your phone on June 10th? From my phone? Yeah. No, I don't. Did you delete them, Mr. Murdoch? Not intentionally. He claims he was worried about his wife and called her a lot within four minutes, but didn't go down to the kennels to check on her. Why don't you remember what you were doing when you were so busy for this four minute critical period? I do other remember what I was, I was doing. Other than I was getting ready to go. Well, that's because that's what I was doing. You made those calls to Maggie in that four minute period You had just seen them a few minutes ago when you say you went down there and came right back. Why didn't you just take that quick little left 1,100 yards away and stop by? See why they didn't answer the call. You're obviously wanting to get in touch with them. Why didn't you go down to the kennels that were so close by? There was no reason to. 
I mean, Ma- making multiple missed calls to Maggie, and she's so close. And there's a driveway right there. Why do you not just go down there and say, "Hey, guys, I'm heading over there." It, it wasn't important to do that. Me, me making those phone calls is simply me letting. I believe I called Maggie, and I believe call, I called Paul, but. That, that, that's simply me just letting them know that I'm leaving for a minute, I'll be back. The fact that, that they don't answer is not unusual at all. Now, it is odd, it is unusual that they never call me back. Um, and, but, but at that moment, the fact that there's a missed call, when, when I know they're on the property, I mean, that doesn't even register at all. That's perfectly normal to try to call somebody who's on the property and not be able to get them. And and as far as not going down there, uh, there, there was no sense of urgency. Maggie was with Paul. You know, she should be as safe as she could be. The crazy thing is that he was asking one of the witnesses, Miss Shelley, to say that he was there 20 minutes longer than he actually was. When he was seen by his house cleaner, Blanca, she got nervous about the clothes that he was wearing, because there was blood on them. So he asked her not to mention the clothes that he was wearing. And when you were asked by law enforcement how long you were at your mother's house, you said 45 minutes to an hour, isn't that correct? I think I said a couple of different things, but I think at one time I did say that. But, you know, at, at, routinely through these things, I kept saying, you know, when you get this data, you'll see exactly. When you look at my phone, you'll see exactly. When you do, you know, so, you know, the, uh, me giving the times was always given with the thought that, okay, that there's OnStar out there, there's whatever. But when you had a conversation with Miss Shelley after the fact, you actually asked her, to say that you were there longer than 20 minutes. You know, I heard Shelley's testimony. I I, I believe Shelley to be a good person. Uh, I wasn't trying to influence Shelley on any particular length of time because at, at the beginning of this, I believed that data would show what data would show. And for me to tell her to say something when my own star is going to show something different just doesn't make any sense. So, you know, I, I can't answer that. What my recollection is is that I told Shelley that, y'all, that law enforcement would be talking to her. We may have discussed how long I was there. At that point in time, if I thought I was there 45 minutes, I may have said I was here 45 minutes, but, you know, I can't tell you. That's the same thing that Blanca testified to, that you talked to her about the clothes that you were wearing that made her uncomfortable, correct? Ask that question again. It's similar to your conversation with Blanca that she testified about when you talked to her about the clothes that you were supposedly wearing what, and what's... made her feel uncomfortable. Do you remember that testimony, sir? He was then asked if he went and looked at the bodies before calling 911, and it's found that he lied to police once again. And it's also great to note that when he was asked this question, his tears stopped on a dime. I don't know what I said to law enforcement, Mr. Waters, but I can tell you this. When I pulled up, and I saw Mags and Paul Paul, I jumped out of that car. I know that I went back to my car, and I called 911 as quickly as I could. That point in time, when I got on the phone, then is when I went to them. You're saying that you didn't say very specifically to law enforcement that you went to them prior to calling 911? When? After you got out of the car, you told law enforcement repeatedly that you went over and checked the bodies before you called 911. No, I don't, if I did say that, I, I, I don't believe that's accurate. To show the vehicle parking at 10.05 and 55 seconds? Yes, sir. 
10.05.57. The Suburban arrives at the kennels. you agree with that? Um, I'm sorry, say that again, Mr. Wood. At 10.05.57, it shows the Suburban arriving at the kennels. Okay. The 911 call was at 10.06.14. Okay. Just about 20 seconds later. You agree with that? Um, I think that sounds right. Yes, sir. I mean, that makes sense. But that goes back to what I'm saying is I, I pulled up. I saw. I saw them. And I know I jumped out of my car. Um, but I believe that before I checked them, in fact, I'm almost certain, that then I went back and I got my, that's when I went and got my phone and I called 911. Okay. And then, after I called 911, they, I mean, there was a little while where there wasn't, I don't, I don't think there was anything going on. And I believe that that is the time period that I went and checked on them. I don't want to belabor this point, but that what you're saying here today, now that we have this data, that's not exactly how you expressed it to law enforcement in your prior statements. Is that correct? No, sir. I disagree with that. Okay. I totally disagree with that, Mr. Waters. Will you point to what you're talking about? Um, as I stated, I'm David Owen and uh, Laura Rutland with Collin County. I'm with SLED. I hate to have to do this. I understand. Yeah. I totally yeah. understand. Yeah. So you don't, you don't have any problem yeah. with it. So um, just start at the top, take your time. Um, like when I came back here, mm -hmm. I mean, I pulled up and I could see them and, you know, I knew something was bad. I ran out. I knew it was really bad. And my, my boy over there, I could see it was. <clears throat> and I could see his brain. <clears throat> and I ran over to Maggie. And <clears throat> actually, I think I tried to turn Paul over first. Um, uh, you know, I tried to turn him over, and uh, I don't know, I figured it out. Um, uh, his cell phone popped out of his pocket. I started to try to do something with it, thinking maybe, but then I put it back down really quickly. Um, then I went to my wife, and I, I mean, I could see. Mm -hmm. Did you touch Maggie at all? I did. I touched them both. Okay. I tried to take, I, I mean, I tried to do it as limited as possible, mm -hmm. but I, I tried to take their pulse on both of them. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and, um, uh, you know, I called 911 um, pretty much right away, and she was very good. Um, <clears throat> I talked to her. Um, I told her I was going to get off the phone to call some family members. <coughs> I did that. Um, and. Um, but going back to your question, I mean, that's, I mean, that's the way I remember it, what I said right there. And I, you know, your, your question about did I do these things before I called 911. That's not what I said then, and that's not what I remember now. Okay. So you're saying now that you went out, you checked, you came back, got your phone, and that's when you called 911? I'm not saying that now, Mr. Woods. I am saying that now, but to me, that's what I said then. I mean, 
I told her, I called 911 right away. I didn't have, there was no time to do the things that I'm talking about doing in the, in, in the time between getting there and calling 911. He also claims that he thinks Paul and Maggie are dead because of the boat accident that Paul was in, but he says that it wasn't the people on the boat or their family, which leaves prosecutors puzzled. Yeah, and just to be clear, Mr. Waters, there was never, ever a point in time where I thought that the people that were involved in the boat wreck mm -hmm. did this to Paul, Paul and Maggie. Okay. I, I've never thought that. All right. I never thought that, but it's literally one of the first things that you said out of the 911 call. No, nah, that's not what I said. I never, ever, ever under any point in time believed that those kids that okay. were riding in that boat or their parents or, or their, their parents. Or, or their families. Mm -hmm. I didn't believe that any of the families, the people that were involved in the boat wreck, had anything to do with hurting Maggie and Paul. Okay. But I can tell you that at that time, and as I sit here today, that I believe that boat wreck is the reason why Paul, Paul, and Maggie were killed. Okay. And I'm certain. So I believe it was, that. It was random vigilantes, the 5 2 vigilantes, huh? No, what I believe, Mr. Waters, is I believe that. When Paul was charged criminally, there were so many leaks, half truths, half reports, half statements, partial information, misrepresentations of Paul that ended up in the media all the time. And when I tell you the social media response that came from that was vile. The things that were said about what they would do to Papa, they were so over the top that nobody would believe anybody would get on social media and do that. But I believe then and I believe today that the wrong person, the wrong person saw and read that. Because I can tell you for a fact that the person or people who did what I saw on June the 7th, they hated Paul Murdoch and they had anger in their heart. And that is the only, only reason that somebody could be mad at Paul Paul like that and hate him like that. All right, so we've got now. We've but got that's why the, the I did then believe it was the boat wreck, mm -hmm. and I believe now that the boat wreck All right, so we've had got, something to do with it. All right, so we've got random vigilantes because of the boat wreck. Now, I don't know that they're random vigilantes. Well, you just said it wasn't the family or the kid, or no. the kids or the family of the other kids in the boat, right? But, but so what? you're saying it's somebody off of social media. And you don't have any evidence of that, do you? Not you just me. believe that. You're just telling that jury that as you try to explain the lie that you told for the first time yesterday. Isn't that right? No, sir, that's not right. It's not right. How? All right, well, let me ask you a question then. So what you're telling this jury is that it's a random vigilante. That's your the 12 year old, uh, The 12-year-old 5-2 people that just happened to know that Paul and Maggie were both at Moselle on June 7th, that knew that they would be at the kennels alone on June the 7th, that knew that you would not be there, but only between the times of 8.49 and 9.02, that they show up without a weapon, assuming that they're gonna find weapons and ammunition there, that they commit this crime during that short time window, and then they travel the same exact route that you do around the same time to Almeida. That's what you're trying to, to tell this jury? You got a lot of factors in there, Mr. Waters, all of which I do not agree with some of which I do. Paul also admits to hiring a hitman against himself where he only sustained a gunshot wound instead of being killed like the plan. You testified yesterday about the side of the road? Yeah, yes sir. And then you heard the testimony during the state's direct case about what you said on the 911 call? You heard that, didn't you? I did hear that. You heard the 911 call? where you said you've been attacked by an unknown assailant and described him? I did. And you saw the video from the ambulance 
where you said you'd been attacked by an unknown assailant and described him? I did. And you heard the testimony from Ryan Kelly, where you, again, went in detail and described this attack from an unknown assailant? I did. And you heard the testimony about your interview on September 6th with law enforcement, in which you went into great detail and, again, described this unknown assailant? I did. And you heard the testimony, and in fact, the image was put in about how you sat down with a sled sketch artist and spent a period of time with her going forward and creating an image of the supposed assailant. I did sit down with a, I, I was in the hospital and they came in, sat down with me, asked me a bunch of questions. Mm -hmm. I answered their questions. And yes, you did. You it sat came there. To a, it came up with a composite. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Sat there and answered their questions just as effortlessly and convincingly as you've been trying to do for the past two days. Isn't that correct? No, sir. That's that's not true. In that hospital, I was, I was. I mean, it, it, I couldn't sit still. I was standing up. I was walking around. I, I was using the bathroom with the lady sitting right there. I was, you know, I was. Two days into not taking, three days into not taking pills like I had been. No, when no, accountability is at your door, Mr. Murdoch, bad things happen. Don't isn't that true? When accountability when is at my doorstep, life, go ahead. Bad things happen. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you mean by bad things? June seventh happened. September fourth happened. I don't believe that June the seventh happened because accountability issues were at my doorstep. Now I do believe in September that I tried to get a man to help me kill myself because issues were at my doorstep. And one of my personal favorite parts was when the prosecutor just started asking him, did you lie? And I thought that was an extremely powerful moment. He was asking multiple questions. I'll show you the clip right here. Mr. Murdoch, are you a family annihilator? A family annihilator? You mean like, did I shoot my wife and my son? Yes. No. I would never hurt Maggie Murdoch. I would never hurt Paul Murdoch under any circumstances. You say that, but you lied to Maggie, didn't you? I did lie to Maggie. You lied to Paul? Sometimes. You lied to your father? I'm sure I did at some point. Did you tell him all the stuff you'd been up to over the years before he died? No, I didn't tell him. Did you lie to your brothers? About financial things? Yes. I would have lied to Randy at some point, I'm sure. Did you lie to him about the last time you saw your wife and son alive? I did. Did you lie to their wives? I'm sure I did. Did you lie to Marion Proctor? Yes. Did you lie to Bart Proctor? Yes. Did you lie to the Brandstetters? Yes. Did you lie to your best friend, Chris Wilson? Probably. Did you lie to your law partners? I did. Did you lie to them about the kennels? Some of them. Did you lie to Mark Ball? Uh, yeah, I believe, based on what Mark said, I believe I did. Did you lie to Ronnie Crosby? According to what he said, I believe I did. Lied to everyone about the side of the road, the people that came to stop to help, and the ambulance folks, and uh, the 911, and Ryan Kelly, and the, comp the composite sketch artist, and all of them, correct? I lied to a lot of people about that. You know why people lie, Mr. Murdoch? Because they know they've done something wrong. For the most time, I do. When all was said and done, Alex was found guilty of murdering his wife and son. He was sentenced to two consecutive life sentences.
And that's not including all the other charges of fraud and all that other stuff he did within his professional environment. While watching the court case, I came up with a few different things. One, the courtroom is very cold. It was at like 66 degrees. Very random, I know. Another is, this guy is a disgusting talker. Holy crap. I had to mute many parts of his testimony because it sounded so disgusting. I initially was going to put a little compilation of it, but I decided not to. And obviously, another thing that I've noticed, dude is a frickin' sicko. You would have to be to murder your wife and son, but then to play it off like it was someone else, and it only happened within the time span of you being gone for like 20-30 minutes. And not only that, he claimed that when he was at the kennel right before he left and he saw them both alive, the dogs were acting totally fine, no one was on the property. So within that time that he left to go to his parents' house and then comes back, they supposedly both got brutally murdered. With his cell phone somewhere on the property. This has been a case that I've been following for a long time, so it's great to see that he was actually found guilty because it was pretty obvious that the dude was guilty. I was afraid he was going to get away from it because of all his family ties of being an attorney, prosecutor, all that stuff. But fortunately, there was enough evidence to convict him, and he should never see the light of day again. Well, except for when he's in jail. Jessica Lester was just three years old when her parents abandoned her. Her mother's adoptive parents took care of her and her siblings after that. Growing up, Jessica was passionate about nature photography. She was not popular in high school, but she had some friends. And while she was in 10th grade, her friends convinced her to date Matthew Boynton, who was in the 11th grade. Matthew was the grandson of a local sheriff called Wendell Beam. He was popular and mostly hung out with the football players and cheerleaders. He dreamt of being an officer of the law, just like his grandfather who raised him after his parents split up. Sheriff Beam also became Matthew's closest confidant. Matthew and Jessica started dating in 2012. The following year, when Jessica was 16, she was already pregnant with a child. When she told her grandparents about her pregnancy, they were open to helping her raise the child. But Jessica wanted to start a family with Matthew. As soon as Matthew and Jessica moved in together, things started to change. Jessica realized Matthew was very controlling. He rarely let her see her friends, and when they visited her family for Christmas, Matthew wanted to leave early before they had even opened their gifts. The same thing happened when her family threw her a graduation party for when she completed high school. Matthew forced her to leave early. For some reason, Matthew did not seem fond of Jessica's family. He liked to remind her that her grandparents were not related to her by blood. And as his control over Jessica increased, Matthew made strides in his ambition to become an officer of the law. First, he worked as a jailer, then a patrol officer. Matthew was as strict and domineering at work as he was at home. It was like he wanted to arrest as many people as he could. He even called the police on Jessica for yelling at him. In December 2014, Jessica was pregnant again. But Matthew was not the father. Jessica had been having an affair, and when Matthew found out, he said he would raise the child as his own. Matthew and Jessica decided to get married after that. Their engagement felt like the practical thing to do, seeing that they now had two children together. Much like many of the gatherings hosted by Jessica's family, Matthew had Jessica leave their wedding reception within an hour of arriving. For the brief time they were there, Matthew brandished a titanium ring with a blue stripe so that everyone would know he was an officer of the law. After the wedding, Jessica became even more isolated from society. They moved into an apartment complex. Matthew would have his grandfather call him in the morning to wake him up. He prohibited Jessica from leaving the house unless he could be with her. Matthew also made sure to take the car keys with him when he left the house for work. He did not want Jessica using his car in his absence. To make matters worse, Jessica's aunt found out that Matthew was violent. He had attacked his stepmother, Amy, who later met up with Jessica's aunt to warn her about him. She feared Matthew was going to hurt Jessica. Six months into their relationship, things weren't going well at all. Jessica found out Matthew was having an affair with Courtney Calloway, a dispatcher at the county sheriff's office. 
Jessica confronted him and told him they didn't have to be together if that's not what he wanted. As she put it, she no longer wanted to play house. Matthew replied by saying he knew they would not work out. After that, Jessica turned to her family for support. Not only did she want a divorce, she also wanted full custody of the children. Her grandmother Martha got her in touch with a lawyer to support her case. Meanwhile, Jessica made plans to move into her sister's, Dusty's, house on April 15th, which was a Friday. She also planned on getting a job at a local chiropractor's office. The night before Jessica's planned move to her sister's house, she went to Walmart to buy formula for the baby. Matthew accompanied her. While they were there, they got into a huge argument, and once they were outside, Jessica refused to get into the car. As was common, Matthew called the police for help. A police lieutenant said he couldn't force her to get into the vehicle since she's a grown adult. It looked like Jessica was finally standing up for herself and Matthew could no longer control her. Jessica ended up going back home with Matthew anyway. Half an hour later, a neighbor heard two gunshots. She then witnessed Matthew getting into his truck and driving off. He went to a Waffle House to meet up with a colleague, leaving his neighbors to wonder who had been shot. At 1 a.m., Matthew received a message from Jessica. She told him that she wanted to end her own life and that he should take care of himself and the children. I love you and the boys, her message read. A moment after this message came in, Matthew was texting Courtney about a joke. He then called 911 and asked for officers to check up on his wife. He claimed he was trying to hurry back to make sure nothing was happening, and yet he was calm. Matthew drove home that night, and as he approached the front door, he radioed in saying that he heard two gunshots. The police arrived with their weapons drawn. They were on alert as they entered the house since Matthew had suggested it was an active scenario, and Jessica was armed. He claimed to be afraid for the lives of his children. The police found both the children unharmed. One was sleeping while the youngest was crying in his crib. The police then came across Jessica's body in a closet. She was unconscious. Her blonde hair was soaked in blood, and she was lying on the gun. On the shelf in the closet, there was a book containing evidence of Matthew's affair. It looked like Jessica had taken her own life. When the police at Sheriff Beam's behest contacted Jessica's family to tell them she had committed suicide, Jessica's grandmother didn't believe them. She had made all her grandchildren take target shooting lessons, but Jessica never joined them because she didn't like guns and didn't want to get near them. She made sure to explain this to the police officers. At the same time, Dusty arrived to find Sheriff Beam outside, which was odd since the house was way outside of his jurisdiction. He told her a helicopter had transported Jessica to a medical center. As it turned out, she was alive. Why would Sheriff Beam ask police officers to report Jessica had killed herself before verifying that Jessica was dead? Something wasn't adding up. Dusty immediately began to suspect Matthew had shot her sister. She told the police officers that Jessica had grown up without a mother, so she wouldn't do that to her children. She wouldn't kill herself. But the police told her that if she didn't calm down, she would have to leave the property. The Georgia Bureau of Investigation started investigating the shooting. They interviewed neighbors, which is when they found out that the gunshots had rang two hours earlier than Matthew had claimed. The neighbor that had seen Matthew drive off after hearing the gunshots also said that they heard a noise, like someone was banging on a door before they heard the gunshots. During the police interview, the neighbor was certain that Matthew had pulled the trigger on his wife. After hearing that, the GBI agents left and never came back to finish the interview. At the hospital, a trauma surgeon with over 20 years of experience claimed that Jessica could not have shot herself. Not only was there no gunpowder residue on her hands, but the gunshot wound was on top of her head. It made more sense that someone held the gun above her skull. Jessica herself would not have been able to do that. 
It was physically impossible given the angle of the gunshot. While Jessica was recovering, Matthew moved into Courtney's house with the children. When he finally visited Jessica, he turned up with Sheriff Beam, who was armed, which was odd seeing that Jessica had entered a coma and was not threatening to anyone at all. When she woke up from her coma, she couldn't remember what had happened to her. A nurse told her she had been in an accident, but didn't elaborate. In any case, with Jessica now conscious, the GBI agents interviewed her. She told them that all she could remember about that night is that she had gone to Walmart. When the agents asked her if she used Matthew's gun, she said she could not even get it out of the case, which was true. She also emphasized that she would never do anything to hurt herself since she has children. Two psychiatrists also interviewed Jessica to determine if she was a danger to herself. But, as was the case with everyone Jessica met after she regained consciousness, they were not convinced that she had harbored any suicidal thoughts. They noted that she had experienced trauma, but nobody was convinced that Jessica was out to harm anyone, most of all herself. As usual, she was calm and reserved. Jessica moved in with her grandparents after she left the hospital. Three days later, the police delivered a family violence protection order stating that she could not be within 300 feet of Matthew or her children. She also had to be psychologically examined. All of this was happening because Matthew kept alleging Jessica was unstable. He claimed that she wanted to harm the children. During a family court hearing, Matthew's lawyer reiterated that Jessica was a threat to herself and her family. In response, Jessica's lawyer pointed out that Matthew's team completely ignored the opinion of health professionals, who did not believe Jessica shot herself. The neighbor who had heard the gunshots two hours earlier than Matthew claimed was not even allowed to testify. So, things did not go well for Jessica during that hearing. Although the court revoked the protection order, Matthew retained full custody. Jessica was only allowed to visit her children once a week for four hours. During these visits, an armed police officer had to be present so that Jessica did not threaten her family. Jessica also had to bear the financial burden for the police officer. In September 2016, the GBI closed the case. They concluded that Jessica had tried to kill herself. There was a lot that they did not take into account. They did not care what the neighbor who had heard the gunshots had to say, nor did they care that the psychological evaluation suggested Jessica had been the victim of a recent trauma. For some bizarre reason, they were eager to close the case. A couple of months later, Jessica alleged that Matthew would not return any of her belongings. He had a bag of hers, which she had packed with clothes since she was planning to move to Dusty's. Matthew told the police that Jessica was lying. He was dating someone else at the time, a recently divorced mother called Shelby. They moved in together in January 2017. And that's when Shelby saw a bag full of Jessica's clothes and realized Matthew was lying to the police. Matthew, that's, that's, not, that's not what I'm asking you. When y'all were in the process of moving and you moved into the house that you're at now, your residence, did you, did you not see this bag? Yes, sir, it was in my storage room, in the, in the garage. All right, and now why would I be holding a picture of this bag? I guess because Jessica brought it into you. Why would Jessica have it if you had it at your house? Um, I don't know. I guess somebody got it from my garage <clears> and my shed. Who would have gotten it? Um, there was a couple of people. Okay. I don't know. All right. Exactly who. Okay. And bag. inside that bag, there were numerous contents inside of it. And one of those is this right here. You know what this is? Looks like Jessica's old retainer thing. Mm -hmm. She had them wear together. Right. The bag was completely filled with female clothes. And this is one photo of it. That's not yours. No, it's not. All right? Yes, sir. Okay. That's not yours. No, sir. Right? Yes, sir. Okay. Who does that belong to? This guy, Jessica's name, wants to be Jessica's retainer thing. If it was in that 
If it was in this right here, where would that have been at? I had all of her stuff in it and locked. What would it have been at? It would have been in the garage thing like I said. Which is where? Which is at my house. Which is at your house? Yes, sir. Did you buy that for Jessica? I don't recall. I don't think I did. Because she had... I think her grandparents did. Because she had retainers before she met you, right? Before y'all got married, right? I believe so. So that would make it whose property? Uh, hers. Not yours, right? Right. Yes, sir. Whose bag is that? Uh, Jessica's. And the contents in the bag? It's got all her stuff in it. So why would you not have brought that to us when you noticed, when you saw the bag at moving? Sarge, I promise I've not been through that bag. The last time I used Matthew, that bag I was for the I didn't ask you that, Matthew. Listen to me, buddy. I, Please, I, who's I, is. I understand what you're saying, it's just because I should have brought it up here. You know, Next all time. things, and I don't know anything about your other issue, but all things involved in reference to this case, all the going around, the statement that you wrote, Where's the statement at? The statement that you wrote. You said a statement. I didn't read the statement. The statement said, what did it say? Uh, it's just very brief. I uh, gave Jessica a property like I gave her a computer and everything. Right. Yes, sir. Whose is this bag? It's Jessica's. I just I didn't think, think about it because I used it as a gym bag and she let me use it. I understand what you're saying. Matthew, you're a police officer. Yes, sir. I understand. You're a police officer, Matthew. You know we are held to a higher standard than anybody else. I understand. You know people don't 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 expect us to make mistakes and they don't realize we're human. I understand that. Yes, you sir. understand that. I should have been smart about <sighs> You work out a lot, don't you? You stay in shape. Try You're to. in good shape, right? Try to. You have two bags that you swap your stuff in between, right? Yeah, I don't have the other one anymore. This would have been your only gym bag. So how would you not do the contents of the bag? If this was your gym bag, man. I have no excuse. Like you said, I should have should have thought about it and brought it up here. That's like having two cars. Yes, sir. If you use two cars and you get in the other one and it's out of gas, then you not know it's out of gas. You're right. Because you've used two cars, right? Yes, sir. If you were using this, being slap full, when I say it was slap full, I mean it was, I want to say, just just a guess of probably 30 or 40 articles of clothing in it. You would have known. I mean, it almost looked like when whoever packed this bag, they packed this bag to move. This is Matthew Boynton, January the 9th, 2017. I was advised to complete the statement on previous date by Lieutenant Yancey. Jessica Lester Dash Boynton's property was already previously returned to her by my stepdad, Charles McDaniel Jr. Shortly after Jessica got out of this hospital, uh, the dining room table, along with other items, were picked up by Kathy Zellner for Jessica. The remaining items, such as Hope Chess clothing and other miscellaneous items, returned to Jessica. I do not have any other items of Jessica's. This is Matthew Boynton. Is that your statement? Yes, sir. Who's that, Matthew? That's Jessica's bag. Jessica's retainer. You understand you didn't buy that? I understand. That does not make it community property. I understand. That makes it her property. Yes, sir. That you're in possession of. Yes, sir. I understand.
bag was turning into us. We have possession of the bag. Yes, sir. We have evidence that says it came out of your storage room. Is that true? Yes, sir. Is there anything you'd like to say? No, sir. I said I was just done with my part script. Do you believe do you believe that statement to be accurate and true? Not now. Did you believe it then? No, sir. Shelby then investigated the shooting and felt that it did not make any sense. A few months later, Matthew and Shelby broke up. After that, Shelby messaged Jessica. She told her that Matthew was not taking care of the children. They were not eating right or sleeping at all. Shelby then did one more thing to help Jessica. She paid a local investigator to drop the bag of Jessica's clothes off at the police station, which he did in May. After the authorities interviewed Matthew about the bag, he resigned. The police then charged him with making a false statement and violating his oath of office. Matthew, I'm walking around outside. Why would you say you didn't have the damn bag when you had it? You know you can't give a sworn statement and lie on it. I'm not sorry. Why would you do that, Matthew? It was a bag, man. It wasn't. It's not like it was. <laughs> Talk to me, man. I mean, help me understand. I'm sorry. I swear. I know it's, I know it's hard to believe, but I didn't think about that bag. Otherwise, I wouldn't have wrote. I wouldn't have wrote. And I said, "Hold on, LT. I got something. Let me go get it." I swear, I wouldn't have done that because I've got two kids, three and one. I wouldn't jeopardize that over a bag. If I'm telling you, sorry. If I would have thought about it then, I would have said something. But you knew you had the bag. Then I, did you not know you had the bag? I'm sorry, I, my mind's right. I don't, I f***ed up, I know I didn't. I should have turned it in, but not only because I'm a cop, because I should have, because it was just, because even if she let me use it, it was hurts. the right thing to do, man. I'm clear. Yes, sir. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have messed up and been in this position because of my kids. But why didn't you turn the bag in when you damn moved? I don't know. I don't know what because I was thinking. Too, I don't know what I was thinking then. Did you think you was going to get in trouble if you turned it in late? I, I guess. I don't know what I was going through. In my mind. What do you think should happen now? Happen. No, that's not what I asked you. So what do you think should happen? I just... I was a kid, man. My kids are daddy's boys, man. If I would've thought about it, I would've done it. Of all, of all the stuff that you, you see about you, you know if you were in possession of something that belonged to her, you know you should you could have brought it to me. You know I'm going to do the right thing. You know I have to do the right thing. I would have took care of it. I would have gotten the bag back to her. But when you knew you had the bag and you didn't do anything about it, man, you put me in a situation where I, ain't got, I don't have any other choice. I'm clear. I'm clear. There's no excuse for it. In July 2018, Matthew had a hearing before a grand jury. But nothing came from it. Meanwhile, Sheriff Beam's popularity had tanked after he was found guilty of protecting a predator in the police force who had been harassing and assaulting women for years. With Sheriff Beam out of the way, Jessica hoped that the law would finally be on her side. But that would not be the case. That year, Matthew also started abusing the children. Jessica reported this to the police. A year later, the case was closed and psychologists concluded that the children were so scared of Matthew, it did not make sense for them to be around him anymore. Still, most investigators who looked into Jessica's shooting received threatening emails. It's unclear what it would take to reopen the case of Jessica's shooting, to re-examine the evidence, and see whether Matthew is an innocent man as he claims. For the time being, however, he remains a free man.
Once again, I really do appreciate you checking out this video. And if you want to help the channel out and keep your mind more active, make sure to download Wodoku today. You can click that link in the description or the pinned comment. So I'm hoping many of you have not heard about these cases. I know I had spent a lot of time looking into all these, so I felt like a compilation wouldn't have been out of the realm of possibilities. I do also have another very long script in the works. That one's a true crime, but it's also got some real 911 calls in there. And that one I hope to have up in a few days as well. So I really do appreciate you checking out this video. And I will catch you in the next one. And just remember, it's always scarier if it's true. Bad bye.